Hi, everybody. Welcome to the first astronomy lecture we're going to have for our online learning um, situation, our ex adventure, maybe, uh, for the year. Um, today, we're going to start by talking about the moon. Um, and um, we'll move on uh, to tomorrow's lecture at uh, 11 o'clock, which will be about the Earth. So uh, to start off with, um, we're going to talk about mostly our moon. We'll mention some of the other ones. Um, and so in our universe, we believe there's lots of moons. There's hundreds in our solar system alone, um, but only one of them is called the moon. And in fact, one of the answers to the first answer on the uh, assignment is about what do we call the moon? And the answer is, it's kind of a trick question. The moon doesn't have a name. Um, all the other moons that we know about, at least the big ones do, um, but we've never officially given our moon um, a name. Sometimes it's called Luna, but that's um, not like an official name. So um, to keep that in mind, that's kind of a true question. The moon technically doesn't have a name. We just call it the moon. Okay, so what is a moon? A moon is any naturally occurring, that's important. Um, it's got to be natural. A uh, satellite of a celestial body that has a greater mass. Um, so like around the Earth, we've got lots of satellites. Some we've put there. Most of them we've put there. But those aren't considered moons because they're not naturally occurring. Um, the way I like to say it's, it's a rock that orbits a bigger rock that orbits the sun. Uh, most planets do have moons, um, and it's usually more than one. Um, Earth is kind of unique that way. It just has the one moon. Uh, Mercury and Venus don't have any. They're just a little bit too close to the sun, so any moons that, that, that they may have had at one point um, would have been um, uh, kind of jiggled loose by the gravity of the sun, so they would have left orbit and most likely crash into the sun. Um, Earth's got one. Mars, even though Mars is smaller than the Earth, it's got two. Uh, and then Jupiter and Saturn are the big ones with 63 and 62. Um, this number changes. Um, some of those moons may be you know, in somewhat stable orbits, some are in very stable orbits. Some are temporary. Um, they come and go sometimes. In fact, I believe right now, Earth technically has a second moon. It's really tiny. So you would never see it without a telescope. Um, but there is an object that is orbiting the Earth. I, I read an article about it a month or two ago um, right now. But it's in unstable orbit. And eventually, it's going to um, kind of come loose and float away. Okay, Our moon is a little unique. Um, by sheer chance, um, it happens to be about the same size in the sky as the sun. Now, the moon, of course, is much smaller than the sun but the sun is also further away. And it just so happens that the relationship between what we call apparent size and further away is, is such that the moon and the sun are about the same size. Um, the sun usually looks bigger, but that's because of the, the glare of the corona that surrounds the sun, okay? not the actual sun itself. Um, if you're ever not sure, if you look at the sun at sunset, when you really just see the, the, the circle that is the sun, that, that circle is around the same size as the moon. Um, it's also pretty large. I mean, it's not the biggest moon. Um, there are moons around Jupiter um, and around Saturn that are bigger than our moon, but it is large compared to the size of its, its parent body, its planet. You know, the biggest moon of the solar system, Ganymede, is bigger than our moon, but it's small compared to Jupiter itself, whereas our moon takes up a pretty significant fraction of uh, the size of the Earth. Okay, even smaller planets like Mars, the moon is pretty tiny by comparison. Okay, also you notice in this picture here, um, out near like Pluto, uh, and of course Pluto's not a planet anymore, and one of the reasons why is if we look, Pluto's moon Charon is almost as big as Pluto is. Um, and then of course there's other objects out there that we're finding that are as big as Pluto, and that's what's caused the reclassification. Okay, uh, the rotation of the moon. Um, if you look at the picture down here, you'll see that one, one of these pictures looks really familiar, and the other picture looks like nothing you've probably ever seen before. And that's because um, as the moon rotates around its axis and also orbits the Earth, the, um, the rate at which that happens is what we call tidally locked. Um, and that word tide, like the tides in the Earth, that's what's actually caused it. Um, they're related. And the, so as the, the moon goes around the Earth, it also turns itself at just the right, the right rate that we only ever see 
this one side. The other side just, it, it never spins around. Now, if you look at the picture, um, both sides are lit up. So the side we don't see is not dark, at least not always. Um, so when we refer to the moon, it'd be better to talk about the near side and the far side versus like the dark side because um, the, uh, the opposite side of the moon is not always dark. Um, it's lit up for 14 days and it's dark for 14 days, just like our side is, okay? So to look at that graphically, um, here's a, a picture of like if the moon did not rotate. So you've got the sun over here on the right, and if the moon doesn't rotate, then the blue side would always face the sun, as you can see here, which means the blue side would always be lit up and the red side would always be dark. But the problem is, is at some points of the, the month, the, lun the lunar month, we would see the blue side, the lit up side. And at other times we'd see the red side and that just doesn't happen. Again, if we go back to this picture, this is the only side we see. It doesn't turn even partially to show the other side. Um, so in fact, the moon does, does rotate. We only ever see the red side of the moon. And if you look at this, this image here, at sometimes the red side is dark, and at sometimes the red side is lit up. So new moon and full moon. Um, that orbit also gives us what we call the phases. Okay, since um, the moon orbits the earth as the moon orbits, as the earth orbits the sun, where the, the, the relationship between where the sun and the earth and the moon is gives us what we call our phases. And some of these you know, you all know what a full moon looks like and probably a crescent moon, um, crescent moon um, and so on. You've probably heard those before. Um, so the first thing we want to talk about is waxing and waning. Waxing moons are those that are moving towards full. It was a new moon, now it's moving towards full. Waning moons were full and now they're moving back towards new. So waxing is towards full, waning is away. And we put that term in front of the shape. So if we look at all of the possible kind of the phases here, we'll start with the new moon. Light from the sun comes in, it hits the, the part of the moon that doesn't face us. So the part that does face us is dark. Um, you can sometimes see it a little bit, um, depending on where in the cycle it is, uh, because there's actually some um, reflection off of the earth. Um, so it's not usually totally dark like you see here, but it's pretty close. Okay, as the moon orbits around the earth, so from A to B, um, again, half of the moon is lit, but the part that we see that's lit is very, very narrow. We call that a crescent moon, or in this case, a waxing crescent, because again, it's going towards full. Uh, point C here, what oftentimes you hear called a half moon, isn't really a half moon because we're only seeing a quarter of the lit up part. The other quarter is on the other side. So we actually call this a first quarter moon because uh, we only, the, the part of the moon that's lit up that we see is only a quarter of it, and it's a quarter or 25% of the way through the, the process. Okay. Uh, part D uh, is still waxing. We haven't gotten to full yet. Um, but we call this a gibbous, okay? That's a, a word you may or may not have heard before. Um, when most of the face of the moon that we see is lit up, it's called a gibbous. And then of course, point E is where we actually have a full moon. Uh, after that, it starts to wane. So we go to a waning gibbous, a third quarter moon, three quarters of the way, 70%, 5% through the process, a waning crescent, and then back to new. Um, this whole process takes around 28 days. Um, and that's in fact, moon is where we get the word month because months are, you know, the time frame is around the same. Um, so that's, that's the full set of moon phases. So um, some of these, like a full moon, a new moon, the first quarter and the third quarter only technically happening at one, at, at one particular time. And then these are kind of, you know, there's really narrow crescents and there's really full crescents so this whole phase is considered crescent, okay? Now, if we look at this picture, you would think that if the sun is over here, we should never see a full moon. Like the, the, the Earth's shadow should block out the moon every time it's back here. Um, but that's not what we see. We do have full moons. And the reason for that is the moon is not actually in line with the sun for most of its orbit. 
okay, um, its its orbit around the Earth is tilted by five degrees compared to the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. So usually, when the Earth the Moon is behind the Earth, um, it's either above or below the shadow, so you can still see it. Um, this is why we don't have eclipses every month, because it's usually above or below. It has to be within a very narrow range, what we call the nodes. The nodes are where the orbits will cross. If it's outside of this range, then it's outside of the Earth's shadow, and you won't get an eclipse. Okay. Speaking of eclipses, um, an eclipse is when the, the system of the Earth, the Sun, and the Moon line up along the nodes, okay, whoops, excuse me, along the nodes, or in very close to the nodes, so that one blocks out the other. Uh, if the Earth blocks light from the sun, you get what's called a lunar eclipse. The moon will be in the Earth's shadow, so it goes the sun, and then the Earth, and the moon. During a solar eclipse, uh, the moon is in between, so the moon blocks light from the sun, and the Earth is in the moon's shadow, so you have the sun, and the moon, and the Earth. Here's a really good picture of how that kind of works. Uh, there's also animation uh, videos uh, on the website too. So go ahead and watch those if you want um, that kind of show the whole thing in a moving process. But, you know, normally during its, its orbit, the moon is going to be above or below um, the shadow. So, you know, and during the new moon phase, the moon's shadow just kind of misses the Earth. It's below it. Or during the full moon phase, it's, it's above or below the Earth's shadow. You have to happen to align at the node. So the moon has to be a new moon or a full moon during the, the, the node phase in order for like all these things to align for it to actually happen. Um, and it's a very narrow window. Okay. So for a lunar eclipse, that's what we're seeing here. You can kind of see, you know, why that is. Um, if it's too high, then like the yellow line here, then it will enter, you know, some of the Earth's shadow or none of it, and you won't get a full eclipse. Now, because the sun is not a point of light, it's actually, a, you know, has a size, it gives off light and it, it makes two shadows, okay? So like this shadow here, this lighter gray area, it's, this is shadow from this side of the sun, but it's still getting light from this side of the sun. And we, we have the same thing up here. This part, this area is blocked out from the lower part of the sun, but not this part of the sun. We call it the penumbra. So it is a shadow, but it's not a real dark shadow. Um, and then there's in the middle called the umbra. This is the full shadow, like no light from the sun gets into here. And you can't really tell, but um, this, this gets narrower and narrower the further out you go, so you can kind of see it better in this picture, how it narrows down. Um, so the moon can enter any one of these areas, and you can get eclipses. Now, a penumbral eclipse, the moon just happens to be too high or too low, and it never enters the full shadow. It only goes into the partial shadow. And it's almost impossible to tell when that happens. The, the, the dimming of the moon is very small. Um, you can get partial eclipses, where it's close enough to the node where part of the moon will get into the umbra, but part of it won't. And then you rarely have the, at least two a year, um, a total eclipse where it will actually be just close enough to the node where it will enter the, uh, the full shadow and you get a full eclipse, okay? Looks something kind of like this. Um, not perfect, this is actually probably a um, uh, partial eclipse but um, this is pretty close. Um, the redness from the, on the moon comes from the fact that light will still bend because of Earth's atmosphere, and red light bends and gets through our atmosphere better than other colors, so that's what gives the moon that kind of yellow-red color, especially if it's near the horizon or during an eclipse. Okay. Solar eclipses, on the other hand, same idea, but we have the moon in the way. So this, these only occur during new moons um, versus a lunar eclipse, which has to occur during a full moon. Okay, it only ever happens during a full moon. And um, solar eclipses only ever happen during uh, new moons. 
And what happens is you end up with a spot on the surface of the Earth that is totally in the moon's shadow, the umbra of the moon. And of course, as the moon, as the Earth spins and the moon moves a little bit, um, that that dark spot will track across the surface of uh, the Earth. We call it the path. Okay. Um, and you can see in this picture, here's an actual picture. Uh, the next slide actually has a better one um, of what a solar eclipse looks like from space. So this dark area here is the shadow of the moon on the surface of the Earth. And then there's a medium kind of dark area. This is the penumbra area. And then out here, there's no eclipse at all. Looking at this picture, these are two, there's a, a time lapse of a solar eclipse. And there's a, a picture of a, a solar eclipse, um, you know, in a, in, a, in a, I don't know where, but um, you can see how the sun is pretty well blocked off. In fact, it's blocked out enough where it gets pretty darn dark, uh, dark enough where you can see some bright stars and planets like Venus. It, it's perfectly dark enough to see that. Now, the weird thing is you end up with a situation where it looks like a sunrise or a sunset, but it's all the way around. Normally, like, um, you know, we see sunrise and the sun rises in the east and the west is still dark. Or at sunset, the west is lit up and the east is dark. Oddly enough, during an eclipse, like, you have that lit up area all the way around the horizon and um, it's dark above that. It's the only time that ever happens. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll see if I can dig up a picture I took at the last eclipse and I'll see if I can find it and post it on the website. Um, Here's a time lapse, and you can see how over time the moon kind of slides in the way and then slides out again. This is not a total solar eclipse. This is what we call an annual, an annular eclipse. Because the Earth's orbit and the moon's orbit is slightly, slightly oval, it's not a perfect circle, there are certain times where the moon is a little bit closer to the Earth. And if it's a little closer, it can block out the sun completely. But if it's further away, then it doesn't quite totally block out the sun and you get this what's called an annular solar eclipse where there's a ring. Okay, here's a, a map of eclipses. As you can see, they happen fairly often. This is a 20 year period. Okay, and you can see that eclipses do happen fairly often. Okay, there's total eclipses, there's annular eclipses. Um, and they happen all over the world. Sometimes they're only over water. Uh, and other times that they pass only over part of land, um, but they do happen. Um, this one here, August 21st, 2017, uh, this is what I actually went to. Um, you could see it here from Michigan, but it was only partial. Only part of the sun got blocked off. If you wanted to see the sun get blocked out completely, you had to be in this kind of narrow area here. Um, and so I traveled down to very near where that star is, um, to watch it um, happen completely. And um, so the reason we went there beca is because that's the area where the sun is blocked off for the longest period of time. Uh, at the edges, so at the start and the finish here, the sun might only be blocked out for a couple seconds. As you approach the middle, the moon and the sun will kind of track with each other a little bit better. And they can block each other out for, the, the moon can block out the sun for a um, fairly significant amount of time. I think where we were, it was like two minutes and almost 30 seconds um, where the, they happened to track in line and, and things were blocked off. So um, we went down there so that we could see it in, in the longest period of time or close to it, some friends of mine and I. Um, this is for 2021 through 2040. And this one here in 2024, is the one that's gonna be of most interest to people in Michigan because this one starts off in the Pacific, it comes ashore in Mexico, and it will travel through the Midwestern states and it will actually graze the, the total area, the totality, what's called totality, will graze Southeastern Michigan and Northeastern uh, Ohio. Uh, if you're in Jackson, it'll be close to total, but not completely. But if you travel just a little bit, you'll be able to see uh, the entire sun get blocked out. Um, if you look, this actually passes right through where I was for the last one. And so the friends of mine that went and myself were actually planning to go back there um, and see uh, this one as well. Same place. So uh, the last thing I want to talk about is where did the moon actually come from? 
Um, there's still some debate about this, but the most widely accepted idea is called the giant impact hypothesis. Um, and we think that this explains uh, a couple of different things. And the idea is that back when the Earth was very, very young, you know, five billion years ago or so, um, uh, when the solar system was not calmed down yet, and there was still a lot of stuff flying around, a very large um, object about the size of Mars happened to crash into the Earth. Okay, and we think a couple things happened. We think that first of all, that's why the Earth's orbit is tilted to 23 and a half degrees, and that's why we have our seasons. We think that's what caused that. Um, and we also think that it threw out this big pile of, of dust and dirt and stuff into space that eventually, because of gravity, kind of clumped back together and formed our moon. And we think this is the, thi the, the reason because um, now that we've gone to the moon and, and collected samples from the moon, we've measured um, certain atomic ratios, isotope ratios of like oxygen and titanium. And since different solar system bodies form in different places, um, we expect that the, the isotope ratio should always be a little bit different from each other. But what we found is that the ratios for oxygen, oxygen and titanium between the Earth and the Moon are really, really, really similar, like really close, um, which would imply that they were, they were originally part of the same uh, object. Um, and so that's kind of uh, not total proof, of course, but that's one of the, the pieces of evidence that, we, that is cited as uh, evidence that this is what happened. Okay. Um, skip that one. The last thing I just kind of want to mention is um, the relationship between the sun, the earth, and the moon is not just about eclipses. It's about measurement, distances, okay? Um, with some trigonometry, some geometry, if you know some angles, um, then you can start to get distances, okay? So, you know, if uh, you happen to know the angle between, like, you know, certain phases of the moon and the sun and the earth, okay, um, you can start to get ratios. For example, um, if you know the angles, then you know the ratio between the distance of the Earth and the Moon and the Earth and the Sun. And that means that if you know the ratio, then as soon as you get one distance, you can figure out the other one. Okay? Um, and then you can use things like the size of the Earth. Um, that's one of the ways that um, we measure the size of the Earth. Um, you know, a lot of times you, you, you people talk about, you know, oh, Columbus discovered the Earth was round. And, um, no, by his time, most people were pretty sure the Earth was, in fact, um, round. Um, and it had been measured. Uh, ancient Greeks, 2,000, 3,000 years ago, knew this. Um, for one thing, they could see that um, the Earth's shadow on the moon is curved. It's not flat. It's curved, um, which means the Earth must be curved. Then you look at something like... Um, these angles, or what we have at um, um, certain times of the equinoxes, um, and you can actually get angles and measure distances. Um, and so um, the, one of the earliest measurements for the size of the Earth, the diameter of the Earth was uh, like 3,000 years ago, and it was all measured by angles. So if you know the angle, you know this distance here between two cities, then you can figure out the circumference. And the ancients actually did pretty well considering. Um, they measured Earth's diameter to actually really close of the actual value. I mean, um, you know, less than three, about 250 kilometers. That's, that's, the, the, that's how close they actually got. Um, you know, the moon's diameter, not too bad. Um, again, once you know those ratios, Sun's diameter was kind of far off, um, but that's because it's really hard to get the distance. Um, but we weren't too far off with the Earth-Moon distance either. So they didn't do half bad, considering. That concludes uh, today's lesson for astronomy. Uh, the next one will be tomorrow at, uh, I believe it's 11 o'clock. Um, again, you don't have to watch these. You can attend, you can watch. Um, but either way, that should allow you to do the questions that are, uh, have been posted. So have a good rest of the day, and I hope I see you tomorrow.